romantic night play. Yeah, it's fun. But safety first. One more rule of our business. Dr. Novellas, episode two. A star is born. Join me. As the fuse is lit. And it's moving quick. So we better get out of the way and watch from somewhere safe. My parents, they weren't very social people. But when they were, it was always the same couple. Bill and Beverly Kerr. Bill, he looked like Thurston Howe. Very put together. Beautiful white hair, tall, tan, had a mustache like Errol Flynn, quick to wear white pants. And his wife, Beverly, they were the perfect match. Neck and fingers draped in gold. She would sit there with her legs crossed, holding a drink and say, a lady only has two cocktails. I'm not sure she really followed her own advice. There, in our living room, in our nice living room, with Bill and Beverly, on the gold carpet with the red damask wallpaper. We're talking fancy steakhouse wallpaper. Red velvet with gold fleck. Patty would come downstairs in her red unitard, unannounced, unrequited, Nobody asked her. Didn't matter what conversation you were in. If you were consoling somebody who was crying, she would start to dance. A floor show, if you will. The room was under attack. Attack by dance. Patty put her little chin over her left shoulder and then her right shoulder, and she walked back, knees high in the air. Where the hell is she going? She turned around and she shimmied, and she shimmied back, and then she did a body roll. She puts her hands up in the air like this, and then she started cheetah scratching, cheetah scratching, cheetah scratching. She dropped her hands and she fan kicked to the left, and then to the right. Then she put her hands out like she was walking on a tightrope, and she dropped to the ground, and she did a tumble salt, and she popped back up. Body rolling, body rolling. She put her hands in front of her face. She put her hands in front of her face and she peekabooed us. Then she put her hands back in front of her face and she peekabooed us again. Then she put her hands back in front of her face. I want to know who was in back of those hands. And then she peekabooed us again. Oh, it was Patty, all right. Then she walked towards us. She body rolled and she went into a bridge and then she kicked her way back up and the room froze. Mrs. Kerr almost dumped her whole white Russian all over her husband's Ferris slacks, going to put it down in excitement to give a round of applause to Patty. Bill Kerr asked my father if it was okay if he used the phone. If he used the phone to make a long distance call. This was the 80s. This was the day of the long distance call. Bill was dialing a number off a business card into the wall phone of a big Hollywood talent agent. Lucky enough, it rang. Bill told him of the magic he had found at 53 Augusta Ave. The phone fell silent for a second. And then the talent agent said, Don't let anybody move. I'll be on the next flight from LAX to Logan Airport. My sister Mosey was the Irish twin of Patty. They were nine months apart. It was around dusk when she was in the neighborhood with her new obsession, Ricky Barasano. Ricky was riding his BMX bike up and down the street, side-hacking trash barrels, while Mosey watched in excitement. She jogged along, Ricky on his bike. A neighbor appeared from nowhere and began to chase them, and they ran past the Pacheros house and past the house with the guy with the big mastiff. And they ran across Augusta Ave without even looking both ways. And they hid behind a stone wall, laid the bike on the ground, hearts beating. Ricky Barasano, he was famous for taking a banaca spray and a lighter you'd get from 7-Eleven. And making the lighter flame go as high as he could, he would spray the banaca at the lighter, causing a torch. It was said both his parents were in jail and he lived in his house alone over by the old age home. And he only went to school so he could get something to eat and he could wash in the bathroom. 
He wore a dirty denim jacket everywhere he went, pins of satanic symbols on the front of this dirty denim jacket. Call back then a headbanger or a wastoid. At some point he'd probably either go to jail or become a biker, or as my dad liked to call him, bikey. Mr. Kirk came back from using the phone in the kitchen. Beverly and my mother were in conversation. When Bill picked up his glass, he had left on a coffee table and made an announcement. I have a friend coming from Hollywood, California, who is interested in Patty and her talent. Ears lit up as she ran into the room, still in her red little leotard outfit. Her big eyes lit up. It was almost too much. She was about to explode. That night, about around 10.30, we were all sitting around the TV. I looked out the big picture window, heard the door open, and Mosey came in. He had a dirty denim jacket on with a satanic pin on it. She smelled like fire. She had a roach clip in her hair with a feather on it that dangled by her shoulder. Mosey beelined it past my parents and ran upstairs to her and Patty's bedroom. My mother let out a sigh, like seeing somebody come back to life, like she was happy she was home. My mother seemed concerned. I heard her on the phone in her bedroom talking to Father O'Connor over at the St. Patrick's Church. You know, Mosey was keeping these late hours, the dirty denim jacket. Something was going on. She had to be possessed. My father, he was on the phone. In the living room, ordering Cape Cod Cafe. He ordered Cape Cod Cafe like he was helping somebody defuse a bomb over the phone. He was accurate. He was clear. His order had to be precise. Patty was in the background, singing a rendition of an Annie song, when my dad asked her politely, politely, mind you, to please be quiet. Patty looked at my father as if she was going to go to the kitchen and get a knife from a drawer and stick it into his stomach. My dad hung up the phone. My sister Patty snuck away and went upstairs and used the phone in Kathy's room, and she called the police on my father. My sister Kathy, Katie as we call her, used to drive herself to West Junior High to 8th grade. That's a true story. But I was in this fam out that night, and I went with my sister. My dad reached in his pocket, took out a couple of $20 bills, and handed them over. And we were on our way. On our way back from the cod. Katie, we're being tailed. Katie looked in the rear view and saw there was the Brockton cops in back of us, coming up Augusta Avenue. We pulled in front of the house. They pulled in right in back of us. The two patrolmen came over to our car as we were getting out. I had a handful of pizzas. Katie gave him a bitchy look. And they asked, are your parents in the house? This pursuit was now going to continue on foot as they followed us to the front door of our house. These cops had the balls to follow us all the way in to the living room of our house. My mother was in the kitchen. She turned around and she said, I didn't know we were having guests. The one patrolman said, we got a domestic disturbance call from this address. Is your husband around? My father was in the bathroom, in Jackie's bathroom, having a quick urination at the time when he came out to be as surprised as well. The police officer asked to speak to my mother in the sunroom. Apparently... Patty had told the cops that my father had attacked her. She didn't say how, but she said that my father attacked her. Unbeknownst to us, apparently, when a domestic abuse call is made, the cops have got to take somebody with them. It was not my father's lucky day. The patrolman asked my father to put his hands on the kitchen counter. This wasn't good. My mother heard this from the sunroom and came in, and she said, what the hell are you doing? The patrolman handcuffed my father right there in our kitchen, in front of all of us. My mother took a slice of pizza and put it to my poor father's mouth and fed him pizza while he was handcuffed. Patty stood there motionless. She looked at my father there with the handcuffs on. 
and she whispered under her breath, Things are going to change. My mother sprang my dad from the cooler a couple hours later. We wanted to know who the hell called the police. Nobody knew it was Patty. Across the street from us lived the Nitsons. It's come to our attention that Patty, if this, if this is going to fly straight, if this is really going to work, she's going to need some management, and it's not going to be anybody that lives in the house. Nobody in our house had the organization skills or the know-how to light this Roman candle and make it blow up in the air the way it needed to be. There was only one person with this organization skills, Mrs. Nitson. She would take her onions and she would put them in hosiery and she would store them all year long. She could organize anything. Her trash barrels were perfect. Her yard was perfect. Mrs. Nitson was perfect. We had to go knock on her screen door and see if she was available for a job that nobody else could do. Harnessing Patty's God-given talent and keeping her moving in the right direction. We knocked on her door. There she was, in her house gown. She wasn't used to seeing us, at least when there wasn't snow on the ground. We'd only go by there to see if we could shovel her driveway. We told her we were here with an opportunity. It wasn't to help us. It was to help her. Not to actually help the both of us. Patty here is a rising star. And we're coming to you because she needs management. Mrs. Nitson gave us a look. It's that same look you would catch from across the street when she saw a police car in front of our house. She shook her head. And she closed the screen door. But Patty was not taking no for an answer. We watched Mrs. Nitson from the sidewalk as she walked past the picture window and sat down to watch her morning programs. That's when Patty went into the Nitson's bushes and waved for me. I took my hands and I boosted her up so she could look into the picture window at Mrs. Nitson. The ship was sinking, and it was sinking quick, and we were trying to bail out as much water as we could. In retrospect, I would have chosen a different song. But here it goes. Patty got Mrs. Nitson's attention, and she began to sing. Hungry like the wolf. By Duran Duran. Mrs. Nitson, she melted. She melted like a gummy bear left on a dashboard in the hot July sun down at Nantasket Beach parking lot. We've landed ourselves in management. The light is green, and it's time to accelerate. Thank you so much for listening. Brockton No Fellas. Written and produced by yours truly, Jimmy Keller. Incidental music by Ian St. Laurent. You can find us at Apple Podcasts. Tell us what you think. Leave a review. Subscribe. Look for us on Spotify as well. And hey, remember, it's nice to be nice. <laughs>